Hey there, I'm Pete Townsend, and this is Money Never Sleeps. We look inside the minds of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is sponsored by Philip Lee, one of Ireland's fastest growing corporate law firms and expert advisors at the heart of the Dublin and London startup, fintech, and crypto communities. In this episode, Susanna Hayek from Irish Tech News interviews me on financial trends to watch in 2021 and beyond with a focus on the digitalization of finance. This episode was originally aired on Irish Tech News in September, and they kindly gave us permission to share the content on Money Never Sleeps. But before we dive in, we brought Rory Galvin from Navirum back onto the show to give us some quick insights on the next edition of the Finsight Series virtual event that I'm moderating coming up on November 17th. And here's what Rory had to say. So, Rory Galvin, great to have you on the show again. Thanks for coming back. Looking forward to doing the FinSight series with you again and the crew that you've assembled for Beyond Wealth Tech, the future of wealth management. What do you think folks can expect this time around? Well, great to be back, Pete, and really looking forward to having a broader discussion specifically around wealth management. It's going to be a blend of the old school, big enterprise wealth managers and, and, and grassroots s and you know, with sort of more of a dynamic future, looking at sort of the, the blend of fintech and wealth, sort of wealth tech, and then perhaps taking a look beyond where the space is going. And so I'm looking forward to the conversation. We've got a great panel. We've got Christian Maynard Phillip from Pattern FI. And Christian is a, you know, a tenured entrepreneur in the, in the wealth management space in general. We've got Kerry Ryan uh, joining us from the Salesforce financial services industry team and, you know, Kerry is working with some of the biggest companies in the world in terms of their, their digital transformation in the wealth space. She's got some great insights as to where the world is going post COVID and beyond. And Joe Parkin is on there as well from BlackRock. So it'd be great to get his perspective in terms of where we're going for the next few years with, with wealth management. And we've obviously got yourself, Pete. I know you'll be moderating. And, uh, but we're also hope, hopefully hoping that you'll be, you know, enlightening us with perhaps uh, some ideas around W3 and perhaps the impact that might have on the future of wealth management as well. Absolutely. Yep. Looking forward to it. Can't wait. And how do people sign up? What's the best way for people to register? Yeah. Well, you can join, go to the, uh, the Navirum LinkedIn page and, and click on the Eventbrite site in there as well. You can go to our Twitter feed. You can go to forward slash Navirum on Twitter. And you can also visit our website. The event is posted on our blog there as well. So those are three ways you can gain access. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rory. We'll see you soon. Take care. Money never sleeps, pal. Thanks to Rory for that quick overview of the Finsight series and check out the show notes for details on registering. So now, let's dive right in with Susanna Hayek's interview of me on this week's episode of Money Never Sleeps. So here with me today is Pete Townsend, not the rock star from The Who, but nonetheless still a rock star of financial services. Pete, thank you for joining me today. For those who don't know you, how would you describe who you are and what you do? Sure. Thanks, Suze. Appreciate you bringing me on to the show. This is great. Big fan of Irish Tech News and longtime contributor to Irish Tech News through a few different channels. But listen, so I am an early stage startup advisor and investor. I focus on fintech and digital assets. And I basically do three things. I help startups get their products to market, get traction, and get funded for the big reason that it is hard to build a product without funding. It's hard to get funding without customers. And it's hard to get customers without a product. So you're either getting into this, if you're doing well with those three, you're getting into this self-reinforcing wheel, or if not, you're getting into this downward death spiral. So I've been doing this for about five years now, after 20 plus years in leadership roles in traditional finance, and it is completely exhilarating. I work with about 12 companies at any one time right now, including Coinbase here in Ireland. I'm on their board, QBQ here in Ireland, who are a blockchain-based financial infrastructure provider. Also, Olivia AI, who provide AI-driven consumer fintech apps, FAC, which is a digital funds network based on R3's Corda, uh, Pippet Global, we're making it easier for migrants to support their families back home cheaper and safer through the digitalization of cash, 
They're based here in Ireland as well. And that we also have a podcast, Money Never Sleeps, where we get inside the minds of entrepreneurs and look at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. That's been a fantastic way for me to take my B2B mindset, which I had throughout my career in traditional finance, and really think about bringing things to consumers, right? The B2C mindset, which is a different kettle of fish. There's no better way to do that than try to distribute a podcast globally. That's rather interesting. What are the latest trends on digital finance? Yeah, I mean, the key words that I look for in what I read every day to help shape my own thesis and what I look for, obviously, fintech uh, being a big part of what I do, embedded finance, which has become more and more interesting in that you're taking miniaturized financial infrastructure via APIs mostly and implanting that into apps and institutions and infrastructure that usually you wouldn't expect it to be there. Okay. A lot of that's happening through Stripe, obviously, you know, with their Irish heritage as well is interesting. Crypto, DeFi, digital assets, blockchain, you know, DLT, NFTs, tokens, tokenization. So all those words are really just about the ongoing digitalization of finance. So digital finance to me is enabling the buying and selling of financial products and services. Now, both by institutions and individuals, not just a consumer thing really through a hundred percent digital experience. And that's the, the key thing there is that it is a hundred percent digital across the entire value chain, going all the way through from how a financial product is created all the way down to how it does what it's supposed to do. When you think about a financial product, you're spending, you're saving, you're investing, you're insuring, whether that's at the individual or institutional level, there is a wonderful example out there of how to do that hundred percent digitally. And it's called cryptocurrency. And we could talk a, a little bit about that later on, but it's really this idea that you do not have to go into the offline world at all in order to move value around the world. Okay. And being able to do that, like I said, whether you're an individual or an institution, a few different hurdles to go through to do that. I think the big upside that I'm seeing really in this space, Suze, is that there is $400 billion in private market cap globally for fintech including some of the big crypto players in there versus about $4 trillion for the S&P 500 financial index of US firms. So 400 billion versus 4 trillion. That is just that 4 trillion in market cap. The public market cap is just for the financials index of US firms. So much upside there. So much room for the ongoing digitalization of finance. And the big, big thing when finance is digital is that the costs are just so much lower because you don't have all this old school, age old infrastructure. So you know, I love the upside there. I'm also a big fan of flywheels doing one thing well. And if you take a look at how Amazon have built their business, and there's a lot of embedded finance in Amazon's business, that people don't really think about too much, but Amazon are very, very good at low prices, but they've managed to build a flywheel around that by offering products to consumers at very low prices. And bringing an audience, bringing this big community online, obviously starting 20 years ago, 25 years ago now, and then more third-party providers, third-party sellers want to come online and offer their products through Amazon. And then Amazon needs to build up all this great infrastructure in order to support all that. So they have some spare capacity and some excess. So why don't we offer that out? And then why don't we build AWS around that? And then we can eventually bring more users to Amazon. So that's a good example. The flywheel, Disney have one as well. They're very, very good at storytelling, but they do that first through the content that they produce. And then they bring people to theme parks so you can be part of the story. And then you can buy the merchandise and take that home uh, and remember the story. And then you want to watch the movie again, right? And then you want to go back to theme park. And it's this flywheel, this self-reinforcing. So really digging into that big time uh, in fintech, especially more recently. And my podcast co-host, Owen Fitzgerald, and I have really trying to nail a thesis on this. And I think we're nearly there and really looking at this, this B2B to B2C bridge within a business. I think companies like Square are doing really well with that. They made an acquisition recently of a BNPL player that is building their flywheel for them. Um, I want to go back to Amazon and embedded finance. So do you think Amazon in the near future will be offering like more digital banking services? I, They might, right? And what you got to really dig into is Jeff Bezos. Now he's, you know, more or less stepping away from the business and more interested in, in rocket ships these days than low prices. But the very ethos of Amazon is low prices. And the leadership of Amazon is looking at this and saying, will the offering of financial services through Amazon enable customers to have lower prices? 
right? If you think about this, everyone using a credit card on Amazon is generating a 3% in the US, a 3% charge for Visa, for MasterCard, for the whole credit card ecosystem to share, okay? And it, when I say credit card, I mean credit card or, or debit card. So if Amazon are able to remove that dependence on the whole credit card ecosystem, then they are saving themselves 3%. And I did the calculations recently, and it's in excess of a billion a year in savings for Amazon if they were able to do that, right? So can they drive that back into lower prices for customers? Probably, I would expect so. So could they start doing some type of digital payments? Yes, there have been, you know... Uh, Rhetoric going around the market recently that they're hiring some crypto talent and blockchain talent. So I think they probably have something up their sleeve, but I wouldn't expect it's going to be as in your face as Amazon Bank. I, I don't think we'll ever see that. I think, like you said, embedded finance, I think that's where it's going to come from. They are already doing and have been doing for years, providing short term liquidity, short term credit for their suppliers that are providing products to customers um, because they have deep insights as to these suppliers' revenue flows because they know what people are buying and they have some predictability there. So they're already doing this to an extent and have their head around it. Becoming a bank is a big thing. I don't think they're going to go in that direction. I think it's going to be more of a Shopify type model, if you're familiar with that, where Shopify have integrated Stripe significantly and are making it a lot easier to bring businesses to consumers and consumers to businesses. I think that's I think that's the play there for Amazon thinking about embedded finance. That all sounds quite positive. The downside would be, you know, monopolizing. I mean, Amazon is such a monopoly already. What do you think about that? You know, the downside of embedded finance. Yeah, like recently I got a Prime subscription, right? An Amazon Prime sub subscription. And it makes me want to order more from Amazon. And my wife keeps telling me, if you're ordering from Amazon, you're not buying Irish for the most part, right? Because it's amazon.co.uk. I get charged through some Luxembourg entity. I'm not buying anything Irish through, through Amazon, right? And I'm a big supporter of buying Irish, right? I'm not overly concerned, however, that embedding finance into Amazon would help them to even more eradicate the small businesses out there, right? The mom and pop shops that might not be selling uh, through Amazon yet. I think th those shops need to think about Shopify, right? And I think it's especially been in the last year and a half with a pandemic that we've seen a lot more businesses open up through Shopify, okay? And, and for those not familiar with Shopify, it's a way to very easily bring a physical goods business online um, and set up the ability to interact through e-commerce with your customer base and grow your customer base, which is quite interesting. So with Amazon's ethos being low prices and focusing on that for consumers, like I said, I'm not terribly concerned about it. If you read the book, The Everything Store by Brad Stone, which is the story of Amazon, the first 15 years, the first 20 years of Amazon, man, they are cutthroat. They are big, big, big competitors all driven by, like I said, the ethos of keeping customer prices low. And to the extent of Jeff Bezos kept an empty chair in the boardroom representing the customer. And so every meeting that they had with their senior team, there was an empty chair that was representing the customer. Okay. So there's a, hey, cutthroat, you know, competition versus customer strong-minded focus, you know, two sides of the same coin. But I'm not going to see Amazon knock everybody out in my lifetime. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> it's an interesting perspective. You did mention Amazon and crypto. Your thoughts on cryptocurrency and PayPal in, in the UK now, they've started dealing with cryptocurrency. I mean, crypto to me is, is you know, it's been an incredibly successful 12-year proof of concept for what is to me the wider digitalization of finance. This needed to happen when yeah, Bitcoin was created back in 2008, 2009 that, you know, was it solving a problem for the world? Was it fulfilling a desire? I think it was fulfilling a desire to give people more economic freedom um, and the ability to just send value and exchange value instantaneously around the world. It's been a, a pretty good 12 year run. Now there's lots still to do in that space, but there's been so much adoption 
of crypto, especially in the last 18 months. CNBC recently put out a map of the cryptocurrency adoption index, more or less. And the top country in the last year, I think, for crypto adoption was Vietnam, which was really surprising to see. Afghanistan was in there as well. And that is not surprising, obviously, based upon what's been happening in the last few months and others where other countries where people are seeking to preserve value in the face of their currencies being devalued, right? So, you know, they're doing that through crypto. Looking at what's happening in El Salvador with Bitcoin being adopted as legal tender and seeing what's happening on the Lightning Network, which is a layer two solution that sits on top of the Bitcoin network to make it, well, lightning fast. If you look at PayPal, PayPal has been a big supporter of crypto and their offering to the global market on that had been pretty much restricted to the US and that they were enabling PayPal users to hold crypto and to pay in crypto in the US. And I think they've just extended that to the UK now, which is interesting. The big thing that if you noticed in the past year or so, in order to really get your head around this, in order to enable payment in Bitcoin, if you are a payment provider, is to build up a, a, a currency reserve in it. Because if you're going to accept payment in crypto, you're going to hold it on behalf uh, of users. Having an inventory of it gives you a much greater understanding of the risks around providing your customer with that kind of a service. So PayPal built up an inventory in it. Square built up a big inventory in it. MicroStrategy, who are not a payment businesses, they built up a big inventory of it in the last year, year and a half, because they saw it as a reserve asset to have on their balance sheet to help preserve currency value. So there's obviously different usages of this, but I think more and more businesses are thinking about crypto, more and more businesses are accepting it. And it's, it's moving so fast that it's really hard from one day to the next to keep up. And unless you're looking at this every day, you know, six months may go by and you just, it, it's a flash, it's a blur of what's just happened. Hey everyone, this is Pete. Let me tell you about the folks at Philip Lee. A few years ago, I was at my first venture capital industry dinner in Dublin, and honestly, I felt a bit lost. I bumped into Andrew Tizali, one of the partners at Philip Lee. He bought me a pint and introduced me to the team, and they took me under their wing. That take-you-under-their-wing approach has been what I've heard consistently from fintech and crypto startups who I know have worked with Philip Lee in Dublin and London to help them wrap the right legal framework around their business, fundraising, and regulatory needs. And I can't recommend them enough. Get in touch with the team at philiplee.ie or on moneyneversleeps.ie slash philiplee to learn more. But it is quite volatile at the same time. You talked about Afghanistan and Vietnam and people looking for alternatives to their currency because their currency is quite volatile. How does crypto pose a solution to that when it is quite volatile as well? Yeah, well, well, I mean, one of the big things to realize with crypto is that there's a lot of cryptocurrencies out there, okay? Whatever country you're in, and you want to move money out of the country to, to send money to your family in the United States, send money to your family, you know, in some other country, or across Latin America, across Asia, across Africa, where the charges to move money can just be ridiculous, right? And that it is difficult to have a bank account and it's difficult to get access to those funds. So doing that through crypto is easier, right? And that when you look at the different cryptocurrencies out there, the most popular, the top two are Bitcoin and Ethereum. And both of those have been moving quite a bit over the last year. There's also a thing called stable coins, right? And USDC is probably has had the most growth in the last year. Also Tether, which has had a lot of question marks around the reserves. Stable coins are one-to-one -one pegged primarily to the US dollar. And USDC said that they are becoming more transparent and more simplistic around how they back the USDC, okay? And that they're doing that just through cash deposits and through treasury bonds. And I think that's it. So you can open up a Coinbase account, for example, you can move money into your Coinbase account and you can hold that in USDC. You don't need to hold it in Bitcoin. Like I said, the most popular one is, you know, is USDC right now. So you don't necessarily need to hold that in Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other asset. It's all relative. But, um, linking to that is inclusive finance. 
Can you tell us more about financial inclusion? Absolutely. When I landed in Bolivia in 2006, when I was traveling for a, a few months with my fiance, now my wife, I had gone from living in Bermuda, spending a few days in Ireland and Christmas, spending a few days after that over Christmas with my family in Boston and visiting friends in New York, to then flying through Miami and then direct to La Paz in Bolivia. And that was just such a big culture shock for me, going from Dublin, Boston, New York, Miami, and then La Paz, and just seeing a completely different world and a completely different set of economic circumstances. And that stuck with me. Doing the work that I do with Pippet here in Ireland, where the whole value proposition is to enable migrants to support their families back home cheaper and safer, right? Because it costs you know, seven to 10% to send your money through Western Union or some of these other remittance apps if you're trying to do this through cash. What Pippet allows you to do is to bring that cash to a pay zone or a pay point or any of these retail outlets that where you can say pay for your mobile phone. And in the same way, you can hand over cash and have a barcode scan through the Pippet app and send that to your, say, your mom's healthcare account back home in Kenya. Okay. And you could do that at far cheaper rates. So working, you know, through these different life experiences I've had, it's just become that much more important to me and seeing how the world is unfolding with such a big, big disparity between the rich and the poor. The more and more you get outside of the corporate world, the more and more you see this. And I'm not saying, you know, that everyone needs to do that because it's not for everybody. But one of the things that, you know, one of my bosses way back 10 years ago said to me when I was still in the corporate world was that Pete, you're too nice. You're too helpful. Um, you need to be more of a jerk. And I'm like, okay, that just doesn't resonate with me. You can be a progressive business person and have a real infatuation with profit without having to be cutthroat. Okay. So I'd say just through all those life experiences, this has really taught me one big thing is that when you, you think about financial inclusion, it's not charity, right? It's a business model. And it's being able to keep your costs low so that your customers don't have to pay through the nose for your product. And banking the unbanked is a big thing as well, where you've got over a billion people around the world who still do not have access to a bank account. So how are they going to transact? As the world has become so much more digital over the last you know, year and a half, last two years. And it, there's this term that I use called the, the digitalization of cash. And how can we move to a world where I think cash is going to be around for a long time, but how can we make it just as easy for people to use cash and to exchange cash for goods, but also at the same time, turn that cash into a digital version of itself? And there are some different academic theories around that that I've, I've spoken with folks about recently. So that, that's kind of how I feel about it. You know, how you feel about businesses and you don't need to be cutthroat, um, et cetera. What are some tips that you would give to startups? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, be a good person, first and foremost. I, I think one of the big things I've learned about the, the startup world is that there are charismatic leaders everywhere in all walks of life, in the startup world, uh, in the corporate world, and that being able to build a startup team takes some charisma and takes some ability to really rally people together around a big idea. So that, for me, it really starts with the founder of the business and saying, what is their background? Where are they coming from? You know, the, the biggest thing when you're a startup is that what problem are you solving? And is that problem big enough for either an individual or a business to give you money to solve that problem? How intense is the problem? How frequent is it? And can you really get your head around it? And does the founder have a deep firsthand experience with the problem they're solving? I've seen some founders say, listen, you know, what's a great business idea? What can we do? I want to run a startup. It's like, no, that doesn't really work. It needs to be you need, the, the, the best startups are those that have a founder and a founding team that really have that, like I said, deep firsthand experience with the problem they're solving. Then when you think about that problem they're solving, wonderful, but does that group of individuals or businesses that you're solving it for, does that market big enough so that you can grow it to 100 million in revenue? That seems to be the benchmark. If you can get a business to 100 million in revenue, then you can get a valuation of a billion. And that gets you into unicorn status and you start thinking about it becoming a public company. Does every business need to grow to 100 million in revenue? No, but when you're looking at investing in those businesses, most VCs will have a benchmark, venture capitalists will have a benchmark and say, what is this business's path to 100 million in annual recurring revenue? There's a formula that I work with founders on to help them think about how they can get to that. 
and how different VCs, depending upon the size of their fund and the stage in which they invest, how they can, you know, what is the target number that the VC would be looking for? I'd say one of the wild cards in there that I picked up on recently, Suze, is that there is solving a problem, but there's also the other side of this that is fulfilling a desire, okay? So using the example of the 1980s with the baseball cards that I used to collect way back when, and were, were those baseball cards solving a problem for me? No. They were fulfilling a desire that I had to get closer to the teams and the players that I was a big fan of. Right. And that all came back to the Boston Red Sox, but I won't get into that. So I was paying a lot of money for baseball cards back at that time. And like I said, they weren't solving a problem. You look at now the NFT space and where that is going, you know, there is a lot of money going into the NFT space. And is that specifically solving a problem, uh, a unique problem for a consumer? Not really. It's fulfilling a desire. It's a desire to be, to have this sense of ownership, right? So you, there, there is this wild card there that has come up in the last number of years. That is, you're not necessarily solving an intense and frequent problem. So, you know, after thinking about the problem, after thinking about, you know, perhaps fulfilling a desire, what's your plan to reach those customers? If you're B2B, how do you bring those businesses to consumers? And if you're B2C, how do you monetize the interest that other businesses might have in your customers? For example, the Amazon model where, you know, they brought more suppliers onto the Amazon marketplace. How do you think about bridging your B2B and B2C for your beginnings of this flywheel that I talked about with Amazon, with Disney? Square are doing that. Square bought Afterpay in Australia. They're buy now, pay later. And that integration of this buy now, pay later, which is an offering both to merchants and to consumers, how does that bring businesses and consumers closer together so that you get the self-reinforcing wheel of momentum around it? Founder market fit is a big thing for me. People talk about product market fit, but the founder, like I said, do they have that experience with the problem they're solving? How can they actually grow and build that business? Are they the right person to do that? It may not always be 100% necessary. You may be the type of founder where you want to bring the business to say a series A, series B, and then step back because it takes a different skill set to get a business from zero to a million in revenue than it would take to get from a million to a hundred million in revenue. And it, it can be just a different mindset. So, and then everything else after that, what traction do you have so far? What technology are you using? And do you have the skills to support that and to be able to develop and grow with that? What's the timing? Is this the right time for the business, right? The number one reason startups fail is down to timing. What are the terms of the deal? And, and you know, who, who are the competition out there? Competition is a big thing. When you hear from a founder, listen, we have no competition. No one else is doing this. They haven't looked deep enough in the market. Do you think the post-pandemic is a good timing for a startup? Or it really depends on what it is, you know, what's the product or? Yeah, it, it is. But it really comes down to what is the problem you're solving is my number one, right? I, like I said, I will expand this now to fulfill a desire. What is the problem you're solving? Have you identified your customer group? Is it big enough? For this to make it all worthwhile and you can do that in any walk of life we saw last year the business hop in just explode right hop in or the the virtual conference software provider and obviously that was all pandemic fueled and they went from you know series a to series c right really quickly and that wouldn't have happened without the pandemic with all the terrible things that have happened around the world because of the pandemic, this business hop in has done really well around that. Anyone involved in the digitalization of finance, not anyone, but you know, a lot of significant players have done really well through this because their volumes have just increased significantly. You know, there was this kind of short lived idea, not short lived. There's still an extent of truth to it last year where when sports were put on hold, that there were things that people couldn't bet on anymore. Right. So they all opened up brokerage accounts and they started just betting and trading and gambling in the markets because it's effectively what you're doing when you're not informed about the trading decisions that you're making is that you're gambling. And, you know, Robinhood's account openings went through the roof to the extent now where they've done their IPO, right? So, you know, there, there's some deeper dives on the, the Robinhood business model that, that we could do that I, I won't get into today. But, you know, I, I think there are businesses that have done well out of the pandemic. There, there are those that obviously have gone under and won't be coming back. And that's unfortunate. But those that have done well out of this have been those that have adjusted. And, you know, whether you have been a fully digital native business pre-pandemic, 
or one that was 100% physical, those that are still around will be the ones that have adjusted and said, listen, we need to be digital first and that we also have an ability to sell goods physically, but that we are, we are digital first. So what advice would you give investors? Invest, investors and startups. And yeah, investors and startups or, you know, and then let's move on to investing in general. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do your homework, right? Never let anybody else's enthusiasm for a particular investment cause you to just, Hey, I'm doing that. Right. Un unless it's money that you can afford to lose. If you're investing in startups, angel investors are probably, and becoming an angel investor is you need to have at least a $50,000, 50,000 euro pot, right. That you're willing to lose. They say that 10% of your own wealth is what you need to be comfortable just being separated from for a very, very long time. And, you know, so if you've got 500,000 in, in liquid reserves, say, great, you can invest up to 50,000 in startups and probably make, you know, five to 10 bets of five to 10 K or more. And the opportunities to do that are limited to things such as crowdfunding, as well as investing through angel syndicates. For example, there's HBAN here in Ireland that provide an umbrella on top of the, the syndicates like Bloom here in Dublin and, and Bull down in Cork. And getting involved in that space, you just need to be willing to part with your money for a long time. 95% of startups fail. So if you are going to get into the space, make sure you do it in an area where you've got some good knowledge. So for example, Irish startups are heavily weighted towards the life sciences. You're going to find a lot of folks here that are angel investors that have a long history in life sciences. And that's not surprising. You know, there are others, you know, just pure tech plays here in Ireland as well. But that is in the same way that you're going to look at a business as an investor and say, does that founder have deep firsthand experience with the problem they're solving? As an investor, can I align myself to that and understand that and understand the problem that's being solved? And if you don't, you know, don't invest. And, but like I said, it is not easy and not incredibly accessible for those with the capital to just start investing with startups. And you, you're going to need some help with that. Investing in the public markets, same thing, do your homework. I've been managing my own portfolio there for 20 years. And when you're making investment decisions, it's on the basis of really understanding that business and where they're going. And that is something that, you know, you shouldn't take lightly because it's obviously your own personal savings and that, that you're making some decisions with. But in the same mindset, I, like I said, I've been doing it for 20 years. It's a long-term horizon in mind. It's not going to be something where you're going to you know, be making crazy liquidation decisions just because something's dropped 10% or 20%. Right? If you believe in the investment, you believe in the investment and you keep going until you no longer believe in your, your own thesis that you've built around that business. Wow, Pete, you're, you are definitely the financial rock star. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to be more of a, of a rock star and play that guitar that you might be able to see behind me that probably the listeners can't see because it's an audio podcast, obviously that, you know, I'd love to be able to play that a bit more. My kids are already racing ahead of me with being able to play their guitars better than me. So, you know, kudos to them for that. I'll live vicariously through them with my own rock star ambitions. Absolutely. So how can people learn more about you? Yep. You can check out the website, norioventures.com, N-O-R-I-O Ventures. Norio is Japanese for a man of principle. And We've grown the business recently and brought on a regulatory consultant because that is a big thing that startups, especially in fintech, need help with and in digital assets. We also have the podcast, as I mentioned, moneyneverSleeps.ie. I had Simon Cocking on back in the 40s from Myers Tech News, along with my co-host, Owen Fitzgerald from Enterprise Ireland. Hey, and uh, the intro music to that, is that you on the guitar or? <laughs> I, I'd love to say it was. That's our producer, Conan Brophy. He came up with that. I said, listen, there's a great song out there that I'd love for you to see if you can emulate. I'm not going to give it away. If anybody can guess what that is, please get in touch. You can get me on Twitter at Pete Townsend NV. Let me know. And but the, one of my favorite songs is, listen, just make something like that and try to integrate Money Never Sleeps into it. And he did a wonderful job with that. It's a great guy, great producer. All right. Well, everyone try to guess that song then. <laughs> yeah. If you can, one hour call to help you solve a problem. If, if whoever gets that. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant. So thank you so much for joining me today, Pete. That was very informative. And I think, yeah, once I have enough money, I'm going to invest 10% of it somewhere. <laughs>
There you go. There you go. Get in touch and I'll, I'll help you out with that, Suze. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Have a good day. You, you too. That does it for this week, folks. And you can learn more about the stories we covered in the show notes on our website, moneyneversleeps.ie. So check us out online and subscribe to our Money Never Sleeps newsletter as well. If you like what you heard, we would sincerely appreciate a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're listening on, as it helps others to find the show. And remember, Money Never Sleeps is spelled as all one word. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for mixing and editing this episode. Conan is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I'm an early-stage startup advisor and investor focused on fintech and digital assets. As always, I help startups get their product to market, build traction with investors, and raise funding. If you'd like to get in touch, drop us a line on info at moneyneversleeps.ie. Finally, until next time, thanks for listening. See ya!